Welcome to a Fognac Island, Alaska. Home to rain, salmon, insanely thick brush, giant bears, nasty hikes, some of the biggest bodied elk in the world, and lots and lots of fog. Remy is worried <laughs> that I wouldn't think it sucked as bad as he thinks it sucks. I'm Steven Ranella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. You can forgive yourself if you've never heard of a Fognac Island. It's the lesser known neighbor of Kodiak Island, the two land masses being separated by a narrow strait in the Gulf of Alaska. There are scattered populations of Roosevelt elk out here, and my friend Remy Warren and I were lucky enough to draw lottery permits to hunt for one. Remy's done this trip in the past, so he's got some idea of what to expect. But for me, this is all new. When you fly into an area you've never been, it's always very disorienting to me. I think the reason it is so like strange is because you haven't like walked or traveled to get somewhere. But then when you fly in, it's just like almost like a shock to the system as you sort of try to account for all that space that separates you from where you were when you took off. And here the funny thing is just to, like, to pull your bag out of the plane, you can't really lay it down without laying it on rotten fish and that bears are dragging up. You got silver salmon and sockeye salmon out in this lake. You'll see them jumping around. It just smells like death, man. Because we'll be camping out in the kitchen of brown bears that achieve weights in excess of 1,500 pounds, we're taking the precaution of stringing up a portable electric fence that'll help discourage any curious bears from sniffing around too close to our tents, food, and gear. You know, when I first became aware of stringing a wire fence for yeah. bears, my initial thing was that it was part of the wussification of America. <laughs> the same way I felt when walking sticks came out. Trekking poles. Trekking poles? Yeah. When I first heard about that, I'm like, what is America coming to? And then, now I use one, but here's the thing. Everything seems silly until you're getting hauled out of your tent by the head. Yeah. <laughs> the thing about bears is people always put out like, oh, you got more of a chance of getting struck by lightning is the one they like to use. But I've been struck by lightning. Okay, That's, so. so there you go there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, your average person, yes. But there are high-risk groups. Right. And big game hunters are high-risk groups. Well, you're around dead stuff, food. Being all sneaky, Sneaking making around, animal making noises. Animal calls. <laughs> having bloody stuff on your back <laughs> while making animal noises. <laughs> exactly. You if know, you sleep a little better, why not? It's exactly. not that hard. It's not that hard to string this thing up. You're not allowed to hunt elk in this area on the same day you fly. So our immediate plan is to hit the local grocery store. Ooh, smells like fish. No, them steelies are out there. Just gotta hold your mouth right, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's a good-looking fish, too. Here he comes. That fish is made for the fire, man. Heck yeah. First cast. That's great. That's a stout silver, dude. That's a good fish. <laughs> Dinner. <laughs> Dehydrated food's all right, but it's not fresh salmon. <laughs> That's some beautiful-looking meat. That's perfect. A little caviar, man. A little roe, a little sushi. Yeah. When we were kids, man, we'd go out in the woods just to make fire. Yeah. That was the entire point. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That was very good. 
Last time I was here, I didn't catch a single fish. Why not? They wouldn't bite. Really? Yep. You sure? Yeah, I'm positive. I tried like hell. <laughs> so you either got like a lot better at fishing or something happened with these fish. <laughs> when you and your bro hunted this before, all you guys hunt was that direction. Yeah, and they were a long ways away from camp. I would say it was one of the hardest hunts I've ever done. It was horrible. I said, <laughs> I will never do this hunt again. And here you are. And then the next year you're like, hey, you want to put in? And I was like, yeah, sure, we won't get drawn. <laughs> Let's do it. Eat some of this, I like the skin. Make a little eggs on a cracker. Oh, there you go, oh yeah, man. Remy dreams of sushi, man. <laughs> Cheers. Fish skin, fish egg. That's the way to do it. I'm telling you what, Sonny, that's a good recipe. Yeah, I like that. Open up a little restaurant here, but I feel like <laughs> you get so few clients going yeah, through. Exactly. <laughs> We wake up the next morning and quickly confirm what Remy expected, that there are no elk in our home valley. The ridge we want to get to is packed in fog, but what can you do? I was thinking of going up there, huh? Yeah, let's go try it. We decide to hike up and take a look anyway. better way of doing this. Coming in thick. Yeah. Put the fog back into a fog neck. Before we enter the fog that covers the ridge top, Remy lays out a few cow elk calls to make sure there are no elk directly above us. Calling to animals that you can't see is known as blind calling. In this case, it feels almost literal. I'm dreaming of hearing an elk bugle in response. But we are met by silence. I wouldn't mind even getting up a little higher just to see it. Yeah. All right, Remy, glass them up. Yeah. <laughs> Something's wrong with my binoculars. <laughs> Below is a large basin and valley where Remy found a herd last year, but it's obscured from sight. We're deeply reluctant to go barreling down through there in the fog for fear that we'll bump the elk without seeing them and then push them even farther from camp or out of the area entirely. As frustrating as it is, it's best to wait for visibility to improve. Do you ever think about just getting away from doing like sucky hunts where it's just like all the rain and hiking and all that? Nah, I, don't, I like it. I have never been the one where it's like the weather's bad and you go like, oh, I'm staying in the tent today. I always go out, everything's wet, I'm miserable. And I'm like, oh, I should have just sat in the tent today. <laughs> My brother, who's a very successful hunter, he's like, I'm not that like, good at hunting. I just have a very high tolerance for suffer. Yeah. <laughs> and out of that comes like some success in hunting. Just keep pounding the pavement. Yeah, just doing just it. Keep yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. You think we should just head down? Like, what do you think? Yeah, the odds of finding an elk in this are about zero. Now that we're up here in 80 yard visibility. I feel like we can bail and not feel like a um, total loser. Yeah. <laughs> There's no wondering what's up here, we know. Cloud, no, no. Rain. It's just like what it seemed like. <laughs> it's very foggy up here. Yeah, man, I'm going to heading back. Cool. That's a good one. I'll follow you. We head back to camp and hunker down, hoping that the weather will clear up tomorrow. The next morning brings more of the same. Oh man, it's getting foggier. I feel it'll clear out. I'm just hoping that we'll be able to pop over at a lower elevation. Like did that next saddle might blow the fog? Yeah, give it a shot, just see. 
Being that there's not a lot of room for imagination on a hunt like this, we make the same plan as yesterday. We're back up where we were the last time we tried this, after a nice, healthy little four and a half hour hike. I just didn't want anyone saying this was easy. Remy is worried <laughs> that I wouldn't think it sucked as bad as he thinks it sucks. So now we're on the same suck page. But, you know, it's only noon, so we could wait to see if it's gonna clear up. Maybe do a little blind call and down into that valley and see if we get a response. We hear the faintest bugle rise up from somewhere far down the valley. Hit a cock. Hit a cock. Remy rips out a response. <coughs> but nothing. You heard that? I thought I heard a bugle, but I don't know. Another day lost to the fog. On our third attempt, things are looking slightly more promising. Once again, we begin the 1,300 foot climb toward the clouds. Maybe this time, we'll find a way to break through. Finally, the fog lifted enough for us to be up high looking at some good ground. This is like a completely different world when you can see. Oh, that's nice. With the fog lifted, we can see all the way to the coast. It takes only a few minutes of glassing to find our first bull. Oh, I got a bull. Yeah. All the while, it felt like the fog was hiding something, almost like some curtain on a game show concealing a new car. We should probably just close some distance for now. Yeah, just sit down there. At first glance, it seems like you'd smoke your way over this landscape. But here, every inch is a mucky, brushy trudge. It takes almost two hours to get over there. All the while, the bull is out of sight. We try to relocate him once we get into his zone. Bull. Nice bull. You see one, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wonder if that's that same deer we saw earlier. Yeah, I think it is. Same exact place. Turns out that the bull is still right about where we first saw it. It's a bit farther than I'd like, and the layout of the land doesn't give me a good shooting position, so I try to move ahead to close the distance. When I get up to a reasonable distance where I can find a good rest, I try to find the bull again, but he's gone. It's like he got swallowed up by the grass. We wait for the bull to reappear, but nothing. I decide to nudge forward where I can get a better view down the valley. I don't have to go far. We hear another bugle. <coughs> Suddenly, there he is. He's got a 
wants the handler. He's got too much brush. Can you nudge him our way, Remy? Come on, step, dude. Oh, here he comes, here he comes. Smokes these things big. I just had to start trying to take them apart, you know. Dang, I told my parents I'd meet them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> good job, though, man. Good job. Look at that. That's the antler hole, man. You know this guy's a big fighter. You know, one of his antlers is broken off, obviously. And here, see that hole? He caught an antler tine through there into here, all this old infection and all this bruising. I cut all that out. <sighs> Remy's been telling me about a wild game concoction called puff adder, which he's eaten while camping out in Africa. With all the necessary fixins laid out before us, my mind returns to that conversation. It's just all fat wrapped up with some organs, some coriander. Almost like rolled up like a sausage. Oh, that's plenty, dude. Yeah. God, that's nice, yeah. man. Look at that. <laughs> There's a high likelihood of a bear claiming this kill site tonight. So we need to get whatever meat we're not packing out tonight up in a tree where it's safe. Unlike black bears, brown bears cannot climb trees. If we can get the meat about 15 feet high, it'll be fairly safe. We have hundreds of pounds of meat to deal with, and it's a lot of work. We won't get back to our camp until 3 a.m. Soon we're headed back to the hanging tree again to retrieve more of the elk on a nine hour round trip hike. We climb up with empty packs and then down with full loads. On a windy, rainy loadout, we pass a brown bear who sat down to regard us with what seemed like intense curiosity, as though wondering about our strange human desire to carry meat around on our backs, rather than his preferred method of gorging himself on 50 pounds of the stuff before curling up to take a nap on the carcass. On our last night, a fog knack almost messes with us by kicking out the most beautiful weather that we see. It's as though it wants us to leave with a good impression. We dry some clothes, catch a few fish, and settle in for dinner. To prep the puff adder, I dice heart, liver, kidney, and tenderloin, and give it a bath in red wine. It's a good looking piece of coal fat. Everything goes into the casing, gets seasoned, and then onto the grill. No pan required. Dang, man. Legit. Well, that's getting good now. Uh, what do you think? I think it looks good. Oh, yeah, man. Sausagey. It's pretty good. The right amount of coriander. Is it? Yep. I didn't mess that part of it up. No. It's so funny, man, like a few days out in the woods and how all of a sudden you start just wanting to eat fried globs of fat. Yeah. Like stuff you would never eat at home, you know? 
just replenish all that stuff that you lost throughout the day. I don't think there's even a way you can eat as much as you lose as far as calories. It's tough. The casing's good, man. Yeah. The casing's good. The tenderloin's really good. I think what makes the casing good is that a lot of the fat gets rendered out of it, so it gets more like a meaty kind of thing instead of just fatty. It actually just tastes like a sausage casing. It's funny how, like, your impression of this place changes so much when the weather's different. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like you perceive it differently when it's nice out than you do when it's raining on you and foggy. And it's hard to get psychologically to that place where you just don't care anymore what the weather's doing, man. Everything seems tougher, too, when it's just really bad weather. And you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. It just drags you down. You dread it more. It's hard to get out of your sleeping bag. And when it's nice, you're like, oh, I love this place. Yeah. <laughs> the other day, I was like, I will never come here again. I will never come here again. <laughs> I thought that the first time I was here. <laughs> It's funny that we sometimes tend to assess the success of a trip based on whether or not we'd return. We come away from things saying, I'd go back again, or I'd never do that again, as a way of passing a sort of judgment. I think it's testament to the uniqueness of this place that both Remy and I leave it with a sort of question mark. Will I be back? Man, I'll need to sleep on that one for a while. But I'm leaning ever so slightly toward a yes.